it really was sort of a nice a nice moment. It felt very apt for for Van der Poel, who is such a sort of big moment rider. I mean, they talk about it in like basketball and football and stuff about like big Here match players who can sort of rise to the occasion. Um, you know, it's a cycling people. podcast, right? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but <laughs> it just drawing comparisons from the, the biggest sport in the world in terms of people coming at, at the biggest occasion and performing there and then, and Fonda Paul does that almost better than anybody else in the Pro Peloton. I, I think you're right. There is just that, that, that Van der Poel magic that we've we've talked about a few times on this podcast about just Van der Poel has his uh, ability more than other people. He can be looking bad, bad in races and then it's just, and it just comes around. He just, he knows how to time these things. And I just loved how aggressive UAE were on the Poggio. I loved the Velens and, and Pogaccia to up attack I thought that was amazing. It was we so fast and aggressive. We actually said that in the in the clip last week. We actually said that that was probably because we were speculating how Tabigacha actually could win this. Uh, there was actually, to be fair, there was one of our subscribers, Chris Wagner, who actually said that uh, Pogaccia was going to finish fourth. So fair play, <laughs> he got it right. That was pretty good go. Yeah. I just loved how fair play. <laughs> he got it right. That was pretty good going. Yeah. But I just loved how it was just completely strung out and then Pagacha just you it cuts to the front shot and Pagacha is absolutely just ripping his handlebars. And it's just the most aggressive scintillating attack I've ever seen. I was like, this is so cool. And like Cern Cloud can't quite hold the wheel and then Ghana closes it. Wow, and Art and Vanderpool. It's just four massive names in cycling. And there's some great pictures out there of all them, of those four riding to the top there. And I just don't think it could have been a, a better four really to, to go over the top. I think the only thing that could have, I, that could have made it better was if it was perhaps not just a Vanderpool solo victory. Maybe there was a bit of a a bit of intrigue going up to the line as to oh who's going to win a sprint, but I do think yeah, like you and said, the kind of the fact that that Van der Poel is following in the footsteps of his grandfather is just a very uh, ceremonious thing. That Van der Poel just keeps on showing his kind of res- not respect, but kind of uh, his connection into his cycling history, which a few riders have in the peloton, but Van der Poel is really able to show respect to that and i think that's always a really nice touch when he wins is that you can kind of throw it back to the the connection that he has to his like ancestors if you well ancestors makes it seem like they're ages like hundreds of years old just his race, granddad yeah a race yeah. his dad didn't win here so yeah winning a race that his dad hasn't won just very poetic i love it i think that's what sort of adds to the van der poel pathos and his narrative is that it is a sort of dynasty with Raymond Poulidor then, then to his own father and then to himself. And he's been sort of, he's been a wonder kid ever since what, 2015, he won the senior world championships in cyclocross. And now since then, almost every year he's been world champion in at least one discipline. It, it really is fantastic to see and uh, to see sort of a nice ending to this, to this story as well. And Paul finally getting Milanus and Remo uh, under his belt. And, I mean, out of all of the, the, those four guys, they all do. They, they all just bring something so different to the table. They've all got their own narratives, and I think that's what made it very in, intriguing. Maybe if we had a group of four that just, if it was like Maz Payson, Sam Carnison, and Mate Mohoric, whoa, with, with Pogacar, whoa, no, no, but no, but in terms of of, of like like the, the narrative that, that they all have, we have the tension between Van der Poel and Van Aert that's been there for so long. Pogacar is the most versatile Tour de France champion in the, in the last fifty years. Pippo Ganna is is the biggest Italian in cyclist North? that there, there has been in a very long time. In terms of his his prestige, he's also from this part of the country, and he's an Olympic champion. Let's not forget. Adds to it, but between those four guys up in front, there are so many sort of yellow jerseys and sort of rainbow jerseys to be shared amongst them on that final podium of Van Aert. Pippo Ganna and Van der Poel. I think that there's probably a, a continuum of rainbow jerseys in multiple disciplines from 2015 onwards. Maybe even yeah. no, 2013, maybe since Van der Poel was junior world champion. I mean, we'll get on to Ghana because I think that we all thought that result came out of nowhere in a way. Ghana, absolutely scintillating sprint that left Pogacar and Wat Van Aert for, yeah, spectators for that second place. What does this mean for Ghana as well? Like, we discounted in your screen days in a way after Tom Pickock wasn't going to be in the race. Yeah. They appeared at the front and we were all like, wait, what's going on? Who are they riding for? And then Ghana just 
Absolutely incredible. I think in terms of the Cobble Classics, I think Ghana's certainly a threat, considering that Pidcock is, um, well, it, it's, I, I, can't, I can't remember seeing an update, but how long he'll be out for, or, you know, basically how limited is his training going to be. And then also you have to consider Ben Turner, you know, he crashed in on loop, so when's he going to come back? It immediately puts Ghana further up the, the pecking list in Ineos's eyes. I really consider the only other people who Ineos could consider leaders as maybe a Magnus Sheffield or Navarez, but I really consider those guys to be more domestiques perhaps. I know that Sheffield did have a really good performance at Plabon Cepel last year where he won, but expecting him to step up that much as somebody who's like 20 years old to be like, right, you're now leading the Tour of Flanders, you know, that might be a weight too much for his shoulders just just for now. But I think that Ghana could certainly launch a real good classic season if he can hold this form just for the next two weeks or so and to Flanders. I don't see any reason why Ghana couldn't do well in those races. His history in those races... I can't ever remember a significant result for all those races. But, you know, we never saw a significant result from Ghana at Milano San Remo before. I mean, he's just finished second. So history doesn't necessarily correlate to future results. It's very possible that somebody can launch a surprise. Uh, best result in Flanders, 98th. And Ooh. he's only done it twice. He didn't finish in 2018. That was 2019, though. He hasn't ridden it since then. Pyro Bay, best result was last year, 35th. But I think he had a lot of bad luck. But we know he won the under-23 edition. That's hope that everyone clings on to. Yeah, Ewan? I mean, yeah, in 2018, he was a different rider. Rode for UAE, let's not forget. 2019 as well. It was kind of under the radar a little bit. He was a good time trialist, but we didn't know him as a classics guy or sort of the engine that he is. But yeah, this definitely was a bit of a surprise. Ghana was just looking so, so good. And for someone who's like 80 plus kilos to be like racking up a, a, a Poggio at the same speed as Pogacar, it's mightily impressive. It's a shame he's not on the start list for the Ronde von Flandre at the moment, because I think he uh, would give it a really good shout. But I think Roubaix probably suits his characteristics more, given that Roubaix, it's, it's, it's really a, a flat guy engine kind of that wins you Paris Roubaix. We haven't seen many Paris Bay since the COVID break, given that there's been such a big paradigm shift in cycling. But from last year, what we saw with Dylan Van Bala, I could see Ghana doing a very similar tactic there. And even just like hanging onto the front group in 2021, Ghana could have been there to contend for, for the podium. So it's definitely pointing towards good things for Pippa Ghana. If everything goes right on the day at Roubaix, I think he would really, really want to get a good result. Well, we could talk predictions as well, because uh, we were a bit with Milan San Remo on a dilly. I, I put him down in the previous show. Didn't nothing happen. Uh, Patrick said Tadev Gacha. You and you said who? And the the World Tour series. I'm uh, as patient. Uh, yeah, I said well, uh, Macho Van der Poel for that, but I think I set him for basically every single monument. So I think, uh, yeah. Do you think uh, Filippo Ghana is gonna where is he gonna finish in this year's Paro Bay? Since that's the one he's down on. Oh, is it? It's tricky to say. I'll go with a uh, seventh place. I think he's a sort of bust or break. I think he'll finish top five or he'll finish 20th, 30th. I'm going to say Ghana on the podium, but that's probably not going to happen. 